we're going to get started. So this is the Responsible Landscaping Workshop um, with the Actively Green Program at Rocky Mountains. Um, so um, in this workshop, we were going to introduce some of the attendees and see uh, what type of information everybody was interested in hearing. And then we'll start off um, just reviewing the, I'll take this off to talk, um, introducing the climate action goals and Kim will share some um, info just briefly about the climate action collaborative and then James is a, um, I think, chair member or leader of the water working group and he'll introduce some of the goals from the water working group of the CAC. And then Nina leads the uh, materials management working group with the CAC, so she'll introduce some of their goals that the group has um, decided on together. Uh, then we'll talk about um, water and water efficiency and Pete Wadden with the town of Vail will do that and then we'll have a little break just in the in between and then come back to um, Colin with uh, Betty Ford Alpine Gardens to talk about some of the most water efficient and native plants that um, we want to encourage businesses to plant locally. And then we'll finish with uh, Sean Breckman with Vale Honey Wagon um, to share some of the expectations for our compost facility and how businesses can help support that facility and the goals that we have by utilizing that facility. Um, and then we'll just end with some questions and resources that I'll share after the workshop. Um, and this will be recorded so I can share it with any businesses, um, you know, for the next like year or two uh, in the future. Um, so if you have joined us as an attendee, if you want to introduce yourself, um, your name and uh, which business you're representing today, and then a little bit about the size of the green space we're thinking about for your business and um, if you're the owner or who if you do know the property owner who that is of that green space um, and then what you were hoping to learn from the workshop so maybe we'll start with cliff do you want to share a little bit about your um who you're representing today sure uh i'm cliff simonton i'm with the cordillera metropolitan district and um, we maintain about 40 miles of roads up in Cordier here that's west of Edwards and, and as part of our overall sort of gated community theme we have a number of uh, flower beds that are located at uh, at signs and, and uh, intersections of various roads uh, throughout the community. We've sort of fallen in I think over the past few years to a uh, it really doesn't matter how much water you put on it. What's most important is to have it just ex exploding with color all the time. Uh, it's sort of very urban, suburban in character. The types of things I think that you would see more, more often in a uh, urban, suburban manicured landscape. And Cordillera is sort of more of a rustic, uh, unmanicured landscape, especially in terms of backdrop. And so. We're looking to naturalize um, our approach. We're very interested in trying to reduce water consumption um, in that regard as well. And so um, looking for uh, the variety of plants uh, in terms of different bloom seasons, different colors, um, especially plants that uh, uh, the deer uh, tend to avoid instead of rip out of the ground right away, which is a very short list, I know. Um, uh, but that's sort of uh, our intent, uh, and we're just sort of on a, on a learning curve with that in mind. Thanks, Cliff. Yeah, it looks like um, now you might be the only attendee that's sticking with us for this workshop. So thank you for sharing. Um, and we'll just have some of the other attendees if they do still join us. We did have 11 register, then they can share 
introduce themselves in the chat box. But again, hey, the Kate. recording will be super helpful. Do we have um? Do we have Vale Health in the room? And yes, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Sure. I'm Kurt Kim. I'm Tim, and uh, I volunteer to work for Vale Health. Mm -hmm. um, green space. We have like a my. We don't have like in Edwards. We have a lot more green space that we're trying to look at. Just I don't know a way to. A way to reduce our water use on a lot of these properties, we are now a tier four water user. Thank you, Eagle River, for letting us know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you can finish the rest of the Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Nikki. I also work at Vale Health. Like Tim said, we have a lot of locations. Um, I think we have 12 total. Um, at the hospital, there's not that much, but like Tim said, in Edwards, um, it's a decent size, and then down in Eagle and Gypsum, and I know looking forward in Basalt and Dillon, uh, there's just a lot of green spaces going on right now, and especially like James has talked about in the CAC and how Eagle River has alerted us that we are in the Tier 4 water usage. So we really just kind of want to get ahead of the curve and learn a little bit more about some zeroscaping and responsible landscape architecture, um, because being such a large commercial business, it is difficult for us to try and reduce our water within like our everyday operations. So trying to do the best we can, at least in the landscaping area here. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> yes, I'm just, we've all worked together so much that I forget they are no longer like Rocky Mountains, <laughs> but work for real health. So thank you for introducing me. <laughs> um, so then just really quick, and then I'll give an intro for each guest speaker uh, before they speak, Kim is the Climate Action Collaborative Project Manager um, with Rocky Mountains. Nina is another Sustainability Programs Coordinator, and they're both virtually. Um, Nina's for the for Zero Waste Programs at Rocky Mountains. Um, and then also virtual, James Dilzal is the Education and Outreach Coordinator with Eagle River Watershed Council. Um, Pete Wadden is the Watershed Education Coordinator for Town of Vale, also virtual. Um, and Colin and Sean are virtual too. Colin is the horticulturist for Betty Ford Alpine Gardens, and Sean Breckman is the uh, compost operations manager with Vale Honey Wagon. So thanks for uh, joining all virtually. Um, and then just to give a quick intro of the Actively Green program, if um, anybody will be watching this that doesn't know, uh, it's a sustainable business training and certification program. And that this is the program that is hosting uh, this topic today and sharing, um, helping educate businesses and sharing resources to help improve um, sustainable and responsible landscaping throughout the valley. So. Uh, this is a program offered to Eagle County businesses, um, and it has three certification levels, bronze, silver, and gold. And um, the criteria standard is part of the sustainable destination certification. Um, so by participating in the program, businesses are helping to support the larger destination. Um, and this is just one other way we help educate those businesses, whether they're certified or just engaging with us. So the Actively Green team consists of Melissa, our um, Senior Programs Director of Sustainability at Rocky Mountains, and then me, the Sustainability Programs Coordinator for Actively Green. And this summer, we also have two sustainability interns, Colton and Bailey, and they're just right behind me here. Um, at Rocky Mountains. So really quick, the Actively Green Bronze criteria that this workshop would help meet is mostly in that environmental management section. And then for the silver and gold criteria, there's a lot more that this workshop would help businesses to improve upon. So um, in the workplace practices, environmental management and community and ecosystem impacts, and it even gets 
as specific as um, talking about landscaping. So this is a good way to help improve there. Um, and then, so this is where that would be the native landscaping and biodiversity conservation, and then non-invasive species too. Um, and if you want to learn more about the Actively Green program, there's an introductory training August 11th, and this will be in person, you can join virtually as well. Um, so just some questions to consider as you're listening and thinking about your green space at your business or maybe even at home. Um, and you can review these as um, you listen back to the recording or just keep these in mind um, as we follow up with some resources. So Kim is going to start us off and I'm just going to really quick introduce Kim and uh, Kim is a graduate of Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida, where her interest in environmental conservation and sustainability was sparked. She has involved herself in numerous sectors in the field of sustainability, including corporate social responsibility, energy efficiency, renewables, demand side management, sustainability strategy for municipalities, and cost benefit analysis for implementing sustainability programs. Um, and she has worked um, on LEED projects and has worked with Natural Capitalism Solutions um, as an intern. Um, so Kim, we'll let you start us off. Awesome, thank you, Kate. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Kim and I manage the Climate Action Collaborative for the Eagle County community. Um, and Climate Action Collaborative is a, a collective of partners from around the community. Um, most of the folks uh, in the room are part of that collaborative and so grateful for you guys and all of the work that you put towards it. Um, and the goal of the Climate Action Collaborative is to achieve the goals within our community's climate action plan. Um, and we recently updated our climate action plan at the end of last year. Um, and, and I'm really excited to announce a new greenhouse gas reduction target and then the priority actions we identified to achieve those target or that target. Um, and just quickly framing up, uh, you know, climate action and how important it is to consider both um, to consider water in the world of climate um, is while the climate action plan focuses explicitly on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, all of the work and resources you'll hear about today um, will support that in, in part and I, uh, let Nina and others talk about that a bit. Um, but it also helps uh, our community become uh, ad adapt to a changing climate and be more responsible with the resources that we have here to make sure that we can sustain uh, our community's future in Eagle County. Uh, so it's both sort of the mitigation piece and the adaptation resilience piece. Um, and that's why water, you know, meets in the middle of those two and is so critically important. Um, so just a couple of the priority actions I'll highlight um, uh, what, what we're working on for the Climate Action Collaborative. Um, and again, these fall outside of the scope of responsible landscaping, um, but, you know, really uh, striving to achieve a 100% renewable electricity supply in our community by 2030. And we've got a great leader in this space. Um, Holy Cross Energy has made a commitment to achieve this goal. Um, and so our, our collaborative is just looking to, to find ways to support that and bring more of that renewable energy to our local community. Um, for buildings, our, our primary strategies are taking advantage of that soon to be clean renewable electricity um, and transitioning our existing buildings to be all electric um, while uh, striving for all electric construction codes by 2030, again, to make sure that our infrastructure is benefiting from that clean renewable energy and not using fossil fuels. Um, and then also energy efficiency for our, for our large commercial buildings is a, a critical component. Um, waste, I'm gonna skip over because I know Nina's gonna cover those ones in depth. Um, and then for transportation, our big focus areas are increasing the number of EVs in Eagle County um, because they have zero tailpipe emissions and uh, uh, really uh, because of that helps reduce our transportation sector emissions and then encourage um, our commuters to use alternative means uh, of getting to work other than driving their car. And then uh, the final piece is trying to move our workforce closer 
to where they work. Um, both of which, uh, those last two are strategies to reduce overall vehicle miles traveled in the community, uh, which also uh, is a huge support to our reducing our transportation emissions. Um, and then I just have one more slide. Could you go to the next one? Awesome. So this is a, I, this is a page out of our climate action plan or a couple pages um, where we wanted to make an explicit tie to the importance of resiliency in our climate action plan. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just about reducing greenhouse gases, but also understanding that our community is already on track for some warming, and that's going to have an impact on waters and fires um, in our community. And so thinking about these as uh, sort of a holistic, taking a holistic approach to climate, I think is really important. I mean, so resilience is defined as the capability to anticipate, prepare for, respond to, and recover from complex, significant multi-hazard threats with minimum damage to social well-being, the economy, and the environment. Um, and so there are two um, sort of core sections of resilience. There are many things of resilience relate to climate, but these two we pulled out from the Climate Action Plan um, have to do with water and wildfire. Um, and so James will talk uh, much more about the, the water resiliency piece and what our water working group is doing to help make our community more water resilient. Um, but this is just to share that we've, we've got some information in this in the climate action plan. And if folks haven't had a chance to, uh, to look at our updated climate action plan, um, again, it was just released in January, so it's brand new. And I encourage all the businesses uh, on the call today to take a look and see what we're up to. Um, and so that's all I've got. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Um, and so now I'm going to just pass it off to Nina and try to quick introduce Nina as well. Um, here, I'll take this off. Nina grew up in Denver and finished her graduate degree in the Masters of the Environment program at CU Boulder in 2018. Um, she specialized in sustainable food systems and partnered with Vail Resorts for her capstone project working on their zero waste to landfill and sustainability goals. Her research was focused on sustainable purchasing and water infrastructure in mountain regions. Um, she's also completed an AmeriCorps service here, teaching garden and nutrition education, um, worked as a cheesemonger in Denver, and even worked with ICLEI USA, um, as Kim and I have as well. Um, and she completed her bachelor's degree at the George Washington University where she studies international affairs, journalism, and anthropology. <laughs> um, so go All right. On. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> um, OK, so hi, everyone. Of course, I'm Nina, um, as Kate mentioned. Um, so I work with um, Kim and Kate a lot, of course, but um, I co-chair the Materials Management Task Force of the Climate Action Collaborative, which is um, our waste working group, so really focused on waste diversion in our community. Um, so I'm just going to highlight specifically the waste diversion goals that we have through the Climate Action Plan um, and then kind of link it back to sustainable landscaping strategies um, and how that can help us really achieve all of these goals. Um, so the top one in, in bigger lettering is our kind of overall waste diversion goal um, for 30% waste diversion by 2030. Um, and of course, any material we pull out of the landfill, whether it's through landscaping or anything else, um, anything we pull out and pull into a more sustainable waste management system will really be helping us with that overall waste diversion goal. Um, the next one is 80% organics diversion by 2030. And organics is really big for this group and, um, and this discussion because of course a lot of landscaping waste is organic material. Um, so that's a, a really great opportunity. Um, and then there's a lot of landscaping waste that can be included in construction and demolition waste um, as well, depending on the project. So um, we would consider um, responsible land, landscaping diversion um, as a help for our 100% recoverable CND waste diverted by 2030. Um, so in general, landscaping waste is really one of the biggest opportunities in our community. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so um, I'm just going to kind of talk about um, why, I guess, why organic material and why landscaping waste can help us with these goals and, and how. Um, so the landfill environment is pretty specifically designed and engineered to lock out oxygen and moisture. Um, and in that environment, organic waste is unable to break down, which um, Sean will, will elaborate on quite a bit more. 
Um, but that is specifically is what's causing methane to be released into the atmosphere, which is a really potent greenhouse gas. Um, so this, this graph right here um, is our 2017 landfill, landfill inventory. So we just took a, a sample of the landfill and figured out what, um, what was going in there. And we found from that that um, organics make up about 37% of our overall landfill stream, um, which includes landfill, landscaping waste like you know, leaves, grass clippings, trees, um, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, so therefore, you know, opportunities for waste diversion from landscaping operations can actually make a really significant dent in that organic section um, and help us to reach our overall waste diversion goals um, and then just help our community as a whole reach our climate action goals by reducing that methane releasing waste to go in, going into the landfill. So um, that's just kind of like a big picture plug for um, waste diversion um, in the landscaping in the landscaping field. So um, thanks. I'm gonna pass it on over. Short and sweet. Thanks, Dita. Sorry. I got You're fine. On mute. Um, so now James, um, real quick, James grew up where water is abundant. Um, in Cleveland, Ohio, and had a job to study environmental engineering at the University of Alabama, where rivers surround everything. After a few summers in Montana and moving to Colorado in 2017, he realized water is still a passion and started at Eagle River Watershed Council in 2019 as the Education and Outreach Coordinator. Their mission is to advocate for the health of the Upper Colorado and Eagle Rivers through research projects and education. Go ahead, James. Awesome. Thank you all for joining and I'm great to glad that there's a workshop on landscaping and water efficiency in our community. I think this is wonderful and thanks to all those who are participating and joining later um, with the recording. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the water working group is doing as a, a sub subgroup of the climate action collaborative, but I thought I would first um, tee up a little bit about why water is so important in our community. Um, we've all heard the saying that water is life and um, it's very obvious we're 60% water, so we need it all the time. We have to continually drink it. Um, for me, I need to be very near it. Um, and it has to be clean and it has to be plentiful. Um, and not only do we rely on it, but all of the wildlife species, the aquatic species, uh, riparian vegetation, birds, mammals, you name it, everything relies on water. And here in our community, that means um, rivers. So we have, we get all of our water from snowpack, about 80%. Um, of our water comes from snow. Um, so we're very dependent on good winters. And I'm sorry for the lawnmower that is happening behind me. We need to talk to this HOA about their excessive turf grass. Um, but um, it's super important. So if we have a bad snow year, um, we're not gonna have a great summer. And even if we have an average one, um, our soils might be really dry like this winter. Um, and we're gonna have low flows. So, um, and it's not only life that relies on uh, the rivers, but here in our community, it's the, it's our economy. Um, pretty much everyone in the tourism business here in Eagle County is benefiting from the river, uh, whether it's direct or indirect. Um, river related recreation in Colorado brings in $8 billion per year. Um, and that includes rafting, kayaking, fishing, hiking, skiing, and everything that's related to support those industries and more industries that I'm not even mentioning. So um, it all relies on healthy rivers and healthy watersheds. Um, when our rivers are stressed, it truly, per, you know, perpetuates into everyday life. Everything gets stressed, especially my group of friends. I'm always talking about river statistics and it's probably not a great thing, but this year's a little bleak. I'll share a little bit later. Um, but next slide, Kate, we have a funny video that kind of just hits the point home um, of why water is so important. Can you guys hear the video? No. No. Okay. All right. We can, this is not worth fussing with. But basically, Thanksgiving recipe gets cooked, cranberry sauce. No one adds water because there's no water available. Um, and it turns into a charry mess. So kind of funny. American Rivers, a, an organization we work with pretty regularly, put that on a couple of years ago. And we, we thought it was great. Um, so next slide, Kate. But everyone can review the video on their own time, too. So that's great. Thank you. Yes, I can share a link. <laughs> Doesn't want to go to the next slide. 
All right. Um, so we are situated in the headwaters of the Colorado River, which is a system that about 40 million people in seven states and two countries rely on for drinking water, irrigation water, river recreation, industries, agriculture, you name it. Um, you can see that the map on the left side there kind of represents all of the, the basins that um, supply water to the Colorado River um, and then more areas even outside of that uh, those basins use the water like um, Los Angeles, San Diego, valleys outside of the, the watershed, um, Denver, a lot of our water, not a lot, but a good portion of water goes to the front range for drinking water. Um, and those basins were divided in the 1920s with the Colorado River Compact and it allocated quite a bit of acreage, acre feet of water to both the upper Colorado, the upper and lower um, basins and then also a little bit to Mexico and that was appropriated in a year when there was more water than there actually ever has been so we've never had quite enough water to truly meet those demands but development has pushed the limits of those and we are uh, getting to a point where uh, it's going to be a little challenging for uh, future development to happen and for water um, there's not enough water for the system so um the river no longer makes it to the, the Delta, it never does not make it to the Gulf of California. And perhaps you've seen some news articles. I was on a hike with Walking Mountains actually earlier this morning talking about water and some of the participants brought up the news stories that they've read recently about inflows to Lake Powell and Lake Mead and how they're, um, you know, they're about 25% or less of average. Um, we're getting to like critical levels in those uh, reservoirs that power much of the West and provide drinking water and irrigation water to a lot of a lot of folks um, in the lower basin. So um, it's getting to a pretty critical point and being in the headwaters, you know, we think that we're fine because we have the start of the river, but, you know, we saw three of the biggest wildfires in Colorado's history last summer, um, all in the headwaters of the Colorado River. So, um, and we're in a, a partially, I think part of our community is in D2 drought, some of it's in D3, some of it's in D4, which is all pretty severe. So um, water's a tough conversation right now, and it's great that you guys are here to take some action. Um, and our community is coming together in the Water Working Group within the Climate Action Collaborative. If you want to go to the next slide, Kate, um, we are bringing together water providers, irrigators, landscapers, conservation groups, um, to kind of have the conversation of what's going on in our community. What are we doing? And really the, the goal is to figure out what we're missing and then to hold folks accountable um, to that, to those tasks. So trying to figure out how we can reduce our water usage as a community so that we can not only sustain our current population, but um, sustain the population growth that's projected here in Eagle County um, over the next 25 years. Um, and you know, create a safe and resilient community. Um, and recently the group decided to focus entirely on outdoor water efficiency as it's sort of the, the best bang for your buck in terms of water efficiency. Um, when you're using water indoors, about 90 to 95% of it goes back into the river through water treatment. Um, but when you're using it outdoors, as little as 15 uh, makes its way back to the river. So it's a very consumptive um, and a lot of times not the most beneficial of uses. And a lot of the, the water goes to, um, watering turf grass, which I hope Pete with the town of Vail will talk, touch on later. He has great presentations on how much um, turf grass there is within our country and is like the most irrigated crop, um, but it really doesn't provide us much except for a space to play soccer on, which is a benefit sometimes. Um, but yeah, we're using the water working group as a tool to increase resiliency in our community and um, really just have those conversations on what's being done and what we need to do better. Thanks, James. Um, now I'm going to really quick introduce Pete. Pete Wadden is the Town of Vail Watershed Education Coordinator. He holds a BA in Environmental Studies from Bowdoin College and an MA in Environmental Studies from Prescott College. Pete has worked on stream health and river restoration in Cuyahoga Valley National Park and in Eagle County, Colorado for Rocky Mountain Science Center, the U.S. Forest Service, and municipal government. He also sits on the board of the Eagle River Watershed Council. When not working to protect waterways, he loves to recreate on them in his kayak or raft with a fly rod in hand. Um, so now I'm gonna let you share, Pete. Are you, are you able to... Um, Share your no, not yet. It says I can't share while the other participant is sharing. Okay. 
That looks like it's going to work. Okay. All right. Can you all see that? Somebody give me a nod, maybe. Yep. Thanks, Kim. Um, so I'll try to do an abbreviated version. I've given this presentation before. Uh, as James said, a lot of it is about lawns. Um, I can probably skip over some of these first slides about um, the dire situation in the West here in 2021. Uh, we're looking at, you know, losses of hydropower in Lake Mead and Lake Powell, um, possible drastic measures in um, going into effect later this summer to try to prevent that. Um, Lake Powell is only expected to receive 28% of its av average inflow this year. Um, and that's pretty bad news considering it's already at 38% capacity. Um, the Upper Colorado River Drought Contingency Plan will likely go into the effect for the first time in history in 2021. 98% uh, of Colorado is currently in drought. 65% of it is in exceptional drought, um, which is the highest level of drought beyond extreme drought. Uh, in the last 20 years, James alluded to this, that when the Colorado Compact was signed um, in the early 20th century, the, um, the flows were quite a bit higher than they have been in the first couple decades of the 21st century. Um, and a lot of predictions would indicate that those flows are expected to continue to drop. So our, our river is over allocated. And as James mentioned, unfortunately, already does not reach the sea. Um, this year we're expending, expecting about half of average flows over the period of May through August. A um, little bit of good news is that our peak was a little bit later than I would have expected. We got into June, at least for the Eagle, Eagle River and Gore Creek. Um, June 10th is typically our about when our peak flow occurs. Last year it was June 1st. Uh, this year, it's looking like it was probably around June 4th or 5th. So it was a low peak, um, but not as early as I was afraid it might be. Um, so why is bluegrass a problem? Kentucky bluegrass needs two to three inches of water per week. Eagle County, uh, depends where, where you're at in the county, but Eagle County only gets about 16 inches of precip per year. So there just isn't enough water here to keep Kentucky bluegrass alive. That means people have to use a lot of um, additional water through irrigation. People also tend to use a lot of fertilizers and other chemicals to keep it green. Uh, and all that irrigation just washes those chemicals into our waterways. So how did we end up with so much turf in such inappropriate places as the arid west? Um, we're gonna go way back. The word lawn actually comes from um, a Middle English word, launde, uh, which meant an open area or a meadow in the trees. Um, in the medieval times, the areas around castles were kept clear uh, by grazing animals, but also for the purpose of defense. In the late medieval period, uh, those gardens or areas surrounding castles became symbols of um, wealth and status, and they were heavily manicured um, to, to show that status. Um, as time progressed, that trickled down to the middle class and to public parks. Um, we started to, to mimic um, uh, those castle grounds on golf courses and in public parks. And then eventually, in the 20th century, um, lawns became a symbol of the middle class um, during post-World War II industrialization. Uh, you know, the American dream that a lot of people in the mid 20th century uh, aspired to looked a lot like this, a single family home with a nice uh, blanket of turf grass around it, maybe a white picket fence thrown in there. Um, that was more or less okay in places like Chicago and Detroit, St. Louis, Cleveland, where uh, James and I both grew up, but here in Colorado and in Arizona and other arid places, um, this, this was a problem. We don't really have the resources to maintain that type of vegetation. Um, early in the 20th century, clover was pretty well accepted as a part of a turf grass lawn, but by the mid 1950s, 
uh, chemicals were in, introduced, including 2,4-D, which is a, a broadleaf herbicide that kills things like clover, but won't kill grass. So people were able to add things like weed and feed to their lawns, um, killing all the quote unquote weeds like nitrogen fixing clover, um, but leaving the grass intact in a perfect monoculture. Um, that meant that there was nothing to fix nitrogen. So we needed to add fertilizers to the mix. Um, and again, those post-war technologies came into play. Um, oddly, and maybe some of you know this, uh, a lot of our um, agricultural and landscaping chemicals were developed by the same, chemi uh, same chemists who were responsible for um, chemical warfare in World Wars I and II. Um, Fritz Haber here, I think, must have been the, uh, the inspiration for several James Bond villains and maybe Austin Powers' uh, nemesis, uh, Dr. Evil. He invented the Haber-Brosch process to extract ammonia from nitrogen in the air, um, which is still used very widely to produce fertilizers and led to what was called the, uh, the agricultural revolution um, that allowed us to feed the billions and billions of people who live on this earth. He also invented Zyklon B, which was used in the gas chambers um, tragically in World War II in, in Germany and Poland. Um, a lot of these chemicals were touted as safe. DDT was one of them that probably a lot of you are familiar with. There are some pretty startling pictures of people just being sprayed with it on beaches and things like that. But it turned out that it was long lasting and worked its way up through the food chain and had impacts, um, especially on large bodied birds weakening their eggs. So it's largely been banned in the US. Um, moving back to turf a little bit beyond the chemicals that we put on it, um, as baby boomers moved from the Midwest and the Northeast into the Sun Belt, they brought golf courses and lawns along with, with them. Um, Scottsdale, Arizona, pictured here, is one of the more egregious examples, in my opinion, of our efforts to make the desert bloom. So lawns currently cover 2% of the land in the U.S. Um, that's about 8 to 10 times the area covered by corn, which is our number two crop. Just for a little perspective, 2% of the area in the U.S. would be enough to cover the state of New York. So that's um, how much lawn there is nationwide. The really startling statistic for me is that um, turf grass outranks the next eight irrigated crops combined by land area. It covers 10 times as much area as corn, more than 10 times as much as pasture land or wheat or non-alfalfa hay. Um, we need about 60 million acre feet of water per year to irrigate all that um, lawn in the US. That would be enough to fill both Lakes Powell and Lake Mead, which is something we badly, badly need to do right now. Um, you'll note the area of turf grass pictured that uh, Floyd Dominey, the, the uh, infamous head of the Bureau of Reclamation was so proud to have placed at the foot of Glen Canyon Dam in the middle of the desert there. Um, for another pers perspective, 60 million acres is enough to fill the Chesapeake Bay. So we use that much water, um, you know, more than enough to cover the states of Delaware, New Jersey, and Rhode Island combined um, in a foot of water in a single year to water our lawns. So um, how do we move past this? Uh, I look back into history, um, look maybe at the victory gardens of World War II when People replaced their lawns or, or filled their yards with um, vegetables to try to uh, deal with the shortage of food resulting from the war effort. Um, the opinions of historians as to how effective that was is mixed, um, but I think we could come together in our own era in the way that people did then, this, this nationwide consensus that we haven't seen in a long time. Maybe it could be, um, it could gather around climate change and the need to, uh, to preserve water in the West. Um, our landscaping also reflects our identity. So you could be um, living in one of these little boxes in suburbia and expressing yourself through 
your conformity with the, the suburban life. Um, but I think most people who came to Colorado um, came here because they appreciate this place. And a part of what we appreciate about it are the native plants that live here and are adapted to the local climate. They don't need as much water or as much chemical assistance uh, to survive and thrive and look beautiful. Um, a more diverse landscape is obviously a more healthy one. Uh, it attracts more pollinators, provides more habitat and more food sources, and it's more resilient in the face of pests, drought, climate change, um, and other, other threats. Um, the loss of native vegetation is one of the issues uh, that has impacted Gore Creek. We've lost riparian vegetation along Gore Creek, and we've seen it replaced with chemical intensive uh, non-native landscaping. Um, as a result of that, we've uh, documented a number of pretty egregious instances of chemical applications. This is a foliar applied tree application, um, totally within the bounds of Colorado law, but it's hard to imagine that some of that pesticide didn't make its way into Gore Creek, um, especially when you look at this next picture where you can see it actually flowing into a storm drain that flows into Gore Creek. Um, so I encourage people to consider creating a landscape that serves your needs. Um, certainly it's possible, like I assume this person does, that you have a son or daughter who uh, aspires to become a college soccer player and maybe you need a soccer field in the yard for them to practice in. But I think most of us probably don't need uh, an entire soccer field outside the back door and could reassess our landscaping. This is a cartoon that was given to me by an Eastvale homeowner um, who is kind of shaking his head at some of his neighbor's landscaping practices. Um, I get a real kick out of that. But there's plenty of evidence around town and around the valley of beautiful landscaping without any chemicals, any fertilizers, or even in this case at the Vale Nature Center, any irrigation. So you could have a beautiful wildflower far, uh, garden, you could have um, native shrubs, flowering shrubs, and things like that, um, and not need to irrigate or use so many chemicals. Um, your landscaping also gives you the opportunity to choose your neighbors. Um, invite some of them into your yard by giving them the things they need to survive and thrive um, and show your stewardship that way. Um, the question that might be in your mind is how do you do that? Uh, there are some great resources available in our community. Um, one of them is lovevale.org slash Gore Creek. You can uh, visit the resources page there and we have lots of brochures and information about um, different types of native landscaping, attracting beneficial insects, xeriscaping, um, you name it, there are quite a few there. Many of these resources are borrowed from other partners who you could reach out to directly. Um, one of them, I believe, is our next presenter. The Betty Ford Alpine Gardens have a couple of very knowledgeable horticulturalists, Colin Lee being one of them, who could give you a lot of advice about what plants might do well um, for your applications on your property or a property you manage. The CSU extension in Eagle, is another great resource. They really exist just to do this, um, to answer your questions about native landscaping and, and landscaping in general. So I would encourage you to reach out to them um, for some resources and advice if you're thinking about making some changes to your landscaping. Um, on the Lovevale website, you can also find a list of um, local nurseries and landscape contractors who've gone through our uh, sustainable landscaping workshop. Um, I can point you to that list of uh, landscapers on the website if you like. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me directly as well and I can, can send you in their direction. Um, and to that end, here is my contact info. Uh, that's all I've got for you all. Um, so I think it's about time for me to hand it over to Colin. Thanks, Pete. Um, and Katie had a question. She said, yeah. um, is the 60 million water for lawns in the U.S. or just for states in the West? 
that is nationwide. I did not find a statistic that was specific to the West. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention, one of the kind of startling statistics though, is that 70% of the water in the Colorado River Basin originates on the Western slope of Colorado. Um, James mentioned that we're a headwaters community that uh, it's likely that we won't suffer quite the same kind of severe droughts and water restrictions that you might see in Phoenix or Las Vegas in the coming years. Um, in fact, Nevada just passed a law um, banning, I think what they're calling non-essential turf grass. Um, so single family homes, public parks and golf courses in Nevada will still be allowed to have turf grass, but things like office parks, median strips, um, are going to have to shift to more native and xeric landscaping. Um, so that's a little bit of good news for you at the end of what might have been a downer of a presentation. Oh, that was really interesting. The history was great to learn about. That was, yeah, really helpful, I think, to hear the history. Thank you for... You're welcome. Thanks for listening. Um, and then I'm going to introduce... You, Colin, if you want to share your screen whenever you're ready, um, I'll just, I won't share mine in between. Um, yeah, no problem. I just want to give this too. I, I've done, I've done that with Pete and I'm an official Restore the Gore sustainability member. So um, yes, all, all nice. about it. So let me pull this, mm -hmm. you guys. Uh, and Colin was born and raised in Colorado, and his interest in plants began his junior year of high school. Um, he obtained a degree in horticulture and botany from CSU, um, and began as an intern with Betty Ford in 2016, and is now the horticulturist. So go ahead. Okay, guys, so I'm going to kind of switch it up here and talk a little bit about the benefits of um, perennial plants and how they work in the Vale Valley and then give you guys a list of plants that do well. Um, something I've learned over my time at the gardens is everybody wants a different type of garden. So um, it, it definitely plays a lot into your landscape. And the first question I always ask is, where are you gardening? So I'm, I put together a general list that is hopefully will meet the benefits um, of all homeowners, at least in one way or another. So um, already it been introduced, but yeah, I found my interest for plants in high school. I am a CSU alumnus, Colorado native, and have been at the Betty Ford Alpine Gardens for almost five years now and started off as an intern. So was doing something right. Um, so again, here at Betty Ford Alpine Gardens, we focus on perennial plants. Um, over 90% of our gardens are perennial plants, and there's a lot of benefits that come to perennials versus annuals. I will say annuals have their place in the garden, and especially, you know, to, to do town, Hannah with the town of Vale, does the pots and everything. So big, bold color is a part of landscape design and city design. But when it comes to planting in the ground, um, perennials are the best bet. And a few of the benefits, as you can see there, is they're much hardier, stress tolerant plants. It's more naturalized looking garden. Um, you can use your garden to grow your garden by reseeding. Um, your long-term costs are gonna be way shorter if you're not buying annuals every single year. Um, they're also winter hardy, so you're not ripping up or spending time and money on fertilizer to make your annuals look big and bold. Um, so a lot of benefits with perennials. Um, we'll dive a little bit deeper into five of them. I'm sure Sean will play on this coming up in a little bit, but um, they really increase soil, soil health and structure. Those remaining root structures that live over the winter and you know continually through the year are actually going to help that soil be less susceptible to erosion as well as create air pockets for microorganisms to live and thrive. And the beginning of all good soil starts with good microbes. And if you create a home for them, it's gonna be a way better garden in the long run that is less dependent on fertilizer and more dependent on our natural microbes. Um, perennials also produce larger root systems so they can access nutrients that are deeper in the soil. 
um, I always like to tell people to do a little bit of research on what their root zone um, capacity is for the plants they're doing, especially if they're going for a monoculture or a few types of plants, but to understand how long that root zone is and, you know, maybe you don't need to water six inches. Maybe that, you know, um, root is only three inches deep. So it can really help you dial in irrigation as well as larger systems are going to access nutrients that are well below your, your topsoil. As previously mentioned, um, erosion control, big factor, especially in riparian areas, which is why we're focusing on keeping our native plants near the riparian and not expanding our gardens up to the riparian areas because we're simply anchoring the soil. Um, that's, that's the way it was. It's the way it should be around water and is much more sustainable. Also for accessing deep water, um, as Pete said, you know, a lot of our native plants here can do very, very well without irrigation. And they do that because they're investing more in their root structures. So again, larger root, you're gonna be able to access groundwater. You're gonna have a larger surface area of that root. So it'll absorb more water when, um, you know, rain happens or irrigation happens. So larger root systems play a really, really big role. Also, simply out-competing weeds. Um, here at Betty Ford, and I'm, the, the battle of weeds is never going to end. That is my job security. Um, but you can out-compete them. And simply by establishing perennials, you can either shade them out. Um, you're either defeating them at the root zone competition by your perennials accessing the nutrients and absorbing more of those, simply out-competing them. And um, yeah, you're just you invest more in your garden and you're actually going to have to do less. But again, there will be weeds and you will be weeding all the time. So that is its job security for me. And it's just simply something that we're going to have to deal with. Once you know how many seeds are in the soil reserve, um, they'll be there for a long time and will continue to be. But we can outcompete them. So more benefits is it does, it saves us time and money. So I, a lot of people with annuals, again, you're reinvesting every year. You're taking the time to plant every year. You're taking the time to rip up every year. And annuals are heavy, heavy feeders. They simply can't get enough. So depending on how big you wanna go, people will you know, dump miracle Grow on them, Osmocote. And again, they have their place, but if you, can, if you can dial this back, especially when you're landscaping at your own home, you're gonna save you know, a, less of a carbon footprint as well as saving more money. Um, the annuals, you know, they, they do, they're really good for, for baskets and stuff. But again, I'm trying to get the people to have a mentality of that's where annuals belong is in pots and baskets that we should not be putting these into the ground especially into our native soils. Um, it's, just, it's just having a, you know, in your garden, one thing that really wants to take as much as it can get surrounded by everything else that will do natural. So at that point, you're gonna feed your entire garden the way that you put that one plant there, which is, is not the mentality that we'd like to have continuing into landscaping. So I always like to tell people the right plant in the right place and pests. So read the label of the plant. I can not say that enough all the time. And I love answering the questions when people are like, what light does this take? What water does it take? Those nurseries grow those plants and give you a label. Most of them besides specialty nurseries that have all those requirements. Follow those requirements, just like the requirements on the back of pesticides and insecticides. Those are legally binding, but just take a minute, read the label, think about it, observe your garden, and find the right place. Because if you invest in putting your plant in the right place, it's going to last way longer instead of you putting a begonia in full sun. Simply not going to happen. Um, a lot of that can happen through trial and error, but if you read the label, you're already going to have a leg up. I get a lot of questions too in the mountains with um, how, how do I ward off the deer and the rabbits and all the pests. Luckily at Betty Ford, we are very blessed to have a unique location in which the animals are not very interested or easily accessible to our gardens. But a deer is gonna eat almost anything or at least try it. Um, I did do a little more research and I have heard liquid fence is a good option. 
But again, um, for deer resistance, there is really not too much you can do. There's a few plants, um, daffodils and stuff that that will ward off the deer or they just simply don't like it. Um, another option that I've been telling people is to do a little more research onto plants that have um, natural toxins in them. So like aconitum, um, also known as monkshood, is a toxic plant. So that being said, the deer might bite off your flower head on that plant and you'll be pretty upset. You're not gonna get flowers, but it might not return next year and it's not gonna eat your whole plant. So that's one area where toxicity is actually beneficial for us. Another great thing I like to tell people that I think a lot of people haven't heard of is um, this method called bare root planting versus plug planting. So a lot of people get your plant order, you're popping plants out, digging holes, and you're putting that plant in with that, with that potting soil around the, the roots. So that potting soil is actually not so great for it. That plant is very used to that potting soil. It can absorb a lot of water, but it actually has more pore space and air space, so it dries out quicker. A way to get around that is to wash off of the potting soil and plant your root, bare root, right into the ground. Um, it shocks the plant, but it shocks it in a way where the plant is forced to put out new roots and then it's sending the new roots out into our native soils, our garden soils, and it will actually adapt quicker and faster to our native soils than the potting soil. Um, a lot of times you'll have a plant that just dies immediately, you have no idea what happened, and you go to pull the plant out and you can tell the roots haven't even tried to go outside of the potting soil. So I highly recommend, especially for perennial plants, um, maybe not annuals, but perennial plants, bare root planting into our native soils. We use this method a lot at Betty Ford for our alpines. We grow a lot of specialty plants. And again, alpines like to be treated like crap. They don't want fertilizer. They don't, they don't want to be pampered. They live on top of the mountain. So all of our alpine plantings, um, we bare root transplant as well as some of our perennials. We're actually planting a new pollinator garden uh, using a lot of our own divisions from a previous garden in there, but we will be doing a lot of bare root planting to, to help those plants catch on to that. So you're probably thinking, show me some plants already. So the next part of the presentation is um, me going through, showing you some, some plants that we, we have all of these plants in our garden that are successful in the Vale Valley if you find the right place. So there's just a nice picture of our garden, our perennial garden in full bloom. Uh, we have a lot of projects going on. We're always doing projects here at the garden, so it never looks the same each year. First, we have Clematis integrifolia. Uh, it's a solitary clematis, nice clump forming, uh, very drought resistant, beautiful blue color. People love it. It's a slow grower. It'll take some time. I typically say for perennial plants, um, year two is when you're going to see your garden. Year one, you plant, but year two is when you're actually going to see the benefits of that garden. So there's a, a picture of it in garden with that is foxtail lily aramiris surrounding it, the, the yellow flower. So great clump forming plant. On uh, this one, they just changed the name. It's Epilobium canum uh, subspecies Garedii now. They're always changing names. I can never keep up with it. But um, California fuchsia or hummingbird trumpet, extremely uh, drought tolerant plant, forms in clumps. Looks really nice weeping over rocks or at the base of rocks. Again, this plant almost takes no water. If you give it water, it's going to be very successful. Um, you know, normal to sandy soil, uh, dry moisture, very easy maintenance. I like to say that there's low maintenance and no maintenance plants. This is pretty much a no maintenance plant besides cutting it back in fall time. Also attracts the hummingbirds and pollinators, so it's great to add some biodiversity of pollinators pictures of it in our garden here and it just does so so well. Um, here we have Ariognum umbilatum sulfur flower. I'm sure everybody's seen this out hiking at some point. Again this is a no maintenance plant. Um, doesn't have the best smell to it hence the name sulfur flower or sulfur buckwheat but again almost no watering. Beautiful yellow foliage can form nice big clumps. Um, it's used for dry land and rock gardening. Again, here at Betty Ford, we specialize in rock gardening. So we are trying to go low irrigation, more native plants. We do have our perennial garden, which is a 
a heavy drinker, but our rock garden, which is over two thirds of our garden, which is four acres, um, is, is pretty much uh, natives or rock gardening plants, which take very low water. So you can just see it there forms nice around that, that sign. I think that picture may actually be up in Steamboat Springs. They've got some really good pumps of that. This is a native GM trifolium, prairie smoke. I'm sure you guys have all seen this. Um, the real benefit to this is it has a beautiful flower, early summer flowering. Again, drought tolerant. We have it in a pollinator garden where it gets no water, um, blooms every year. And then the seed head is, is kind of a, uh, a bonus on that. It, everybody calls it like a Dr. Seuss flower. So even after the flower, if you leave the seed head on, again, for it to spread into your garden um, down the road, uh, you basically get two blooms for it. So I love pumping plants that have, um, you know, a dual benefit, especially in that seed head. And there it is out about in the wild. All right, Pulsatilla patens. I'm sure you've seen this one as well. Same as the last one, you get a double benefit here. Uh, you get that Dr. Seuss seed head look, which is that bottom photo. Low, low maintenance, low water. That's that early spring flower. I love putting this in the gardens up here because once this flower blooms, you know spring is here. That means it's time to get into your soil, time to start working. So this is a big uh, sign plant for us that, yep, it's actually spring in the mountains because you never really know. And uh, yeah, it has, has great foliage, hairy foliage, and, and that beautiful flower and seed head. So double, double on that one. Uh, this is a new plant I added into this presentation. Um, I know a lot of homeowners up here have water features and or maybe streams in their backyard or wet bog areas. Um, this is Primula japonica. And then there's another one mixed in there, Primula uh, belisiana. These are great plants that do well tucked right up against a stream. They want their feet wet. So a lot of people don't know what to plant there. A lot of stuff can rot out. Um, believe it or not, that primula border, it's been here long before I, but the amount of seeds that it produces every year and the amount of seeds that actually come up is uh, astounding. So I, I love this plant for any wet areas. Um, yeah, if you've got a stream, this is great. And it just reseeds itself. So again, you can find this at uh, Bluebird Nursery here. Uh, I think they're out of Nebraska actually, but it's not an expensive plant to, to plant at all. And it's very hardy, winter hardy, comes back every year for us and just spreads around the garden. There's a few photos of it. You can get it in cool and hot colors. Um, another one, you guys have all seen this one, Linum lewisii. It's our, it's our blue flax or Lewis's flax. It's in our pollinator garden, takes no water, drought tolerant. Everybody loves the blue color. It gives that nice texture, foliage, grass-like. Um, it's great for prairies, rock gardens, fields, even woodlands it can establish. Again, it's a native, so if it gets out of hand or starts to run away, it's not such a big deal because it belongs here. Picture of it in our garden. It does really well with um. California poppy, that orange and blue combo is very beautiful. This is just a fun one. Uh, people really like the foliage. It looks like hops. This is Aregnum, um, Dubonicum. It's hop flower, so great for tucking into rock areas. Has that nice aromatic smell. Um, deer might not eat that one because it's so aromatic, but very drought tolerant. I love the little pink flowers and then the green cones along the side. So. Very nice foliage and flowers on that. Um, really want to pump penstemums as well. I cannot, I, I only put pinifolius in here. It's got a nice leaf, but any penstemums, um, very drought tolerant, have beautiful flowers. They're also known as mountain beard tongues. We have a ton of native penstemums that again, it's, it's a no maintenance plant, but they have um, made a few varieties that are a little bit smaller, different colors, kind of a ground creeper and is a definitely a tractor for pollinators. The hummingbirds, hummingbird moss, absolutely love this one, forms those nice clumps and is readily accessible from, from your nurseries. Uh, Porovskia, Russian sage, this is used quite a bit. The town of Ailes used this in a few areas. Again, no maintenance plant, blooms almost all summer long. Beautiful blooms, very aromatic, might be deer resistant because of all the, the secondary phytochemicals in there. 
it's again low maintenance you cut this thing back in fall time and and you're good to go it's it's perfect for a garden backdrop if you want smaller stuff in front of it um i can't get enough of this shrub i finally talked nick into to getting some for this new pollinator garden that we're doing and we've got i think about eight of them we're going to put in so again on a bad bad water year like this like this plant is going to thrive and show through Mahonia repens. This is Oregon uh, creeping Oregon grape or Oregon grape holly. Makes actually a really good jam. I've collected the berries. Um, very seedy. Definitely get the seeds out if you're going to do that. But this one is tough. It can provide, uh, you know, not a lot of animals are going to walk through that. It hurts my hands when I'm out there trimming it down. Has beautiful fall foliage. Turns that deep red. Uh, overwinters really well for us here in Vail and Down Valley will only do better. Uh, it's a fast grower and again you get those beautiful yellow blooms that are low to the ground so a nice ground creeper. Garden again. And then lastly I can't I can't tell people enough to do wildflower seeds. So there's a company called Applewood Seeds out of it's actually Applewood Colorado it's around Wheat Ridge area and they do really, really amazing seed mixtures. They have a Rocky Mountain High Pollinator. They have an annual mix. They have a drought mix, low maintenance mix. You can do custom blends. This is a shot actually of our garden. I believe this was the Mountain Pollinator mix. And you can buy a pound of seed, which is a lot of seed for like 80 bucks for them. They're commercial accounts only, but if you're trying to give seed packets to the public, highly recommend using Applewood. Um, a few tips for seed sowing is, you know, wait for a nice rainy week, early, early spring, till your soil just a little bit. I throw the seeds down, I actually walk on top of them to compact them into the soil so they don't blow away. But it is a very cost effective way to do an entire garden or to do filler in between your established garden. Again, they have multiple blends. I did a dryland blend on our green roof that I hope comes up that's supposed to take basically no excess irrigation and you've got a lot of options. So really look into the seed mixes and what's available out there. It is a hidden gem that a lot of people do not do. And don't give up on the first try. If they don't come up, I will sow seeds two or three times into early summer. So that being said, thank you. Um, forget the date on there, but yeah, I'm really excited to, to be presenting for you guys. And please, if you have any questions, email me at Colin at BettyFordAlpineGardens.org. I'm in the garden from eight to four, Monday through Friday for the overalls and the long hair. And I am more than willing to answer specialized questions, general questions, and or just talk plants. So thank you very much, guys. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, feel free to chime in. Thank you, Colin. That was- You're so fun. welcome. Fun to look at all those really pretty and well native plants. Yes, it is. There's, and there's much, much more here. So there we yeah, go. That, that gives you a good list. Like Pete said, it's a good list for um, you're giving me good ideas for taking home. Yeah, and I think next year, if we do this again as well, um, with the new building of our new pollinator garden, and there's talk of us with the town possibly getting another strip of land, uh, we're going to be doing like a water wise garden in the future, which will which will be nice to see. So if that ends up happening, I can definitely cater this presentation to a more water wise in the future. Yeah, that's exciting. Maybe we'll have to turn it into a field trip. For a chunk. It comes into right, the thank garden. you for the opportunity. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think we are going to now take just like a five minute break. Um, so... hey, I have a question for Colin. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, that was really awesome, Colin. And Pete, yours was too. These are so great, um, wonderful presentations. Hey, I was just wondering, Colin, if anybody watching this wanted to uh, get some of the plants that you talked about, are there nurseries in Colorado or where would you recommend that a homeowner or maybe like a, um, a land manager might get some of these plants? Yes, okay, so we actually just found out this year. So getting plants now is, is a hot commodity. Everybody wanted to garden over COVID and is continuing to garden, which I love. So plants are a little scarce, but um, there's gullies in Fort Collins. 
great alternative or a great option. I believe they're not wholesale. They sell to the public. There is Little Valley, which is located down in Denver. I believe they are a wholesale nursery only, but again, if you know somebody, you can get some extra plants tagged on. Uh, we use Bluebird Nursery. They will ship, I don't believe they're wholesale. They come from Nebraska. And we just found the hidden gem, which is in the valley, which is Eagle Gardens. Holy cow, these guys really came through for us this year. Um, we had two plant orders arrive, one from Little Valley with half of the order missing due to back order and or something went wrong in their greenhouses. Nick, who now lives in Eagle, went to Eagle Gardens and they had amazing plants. As far as I know, they only had gallon size, but holy cow, the plants were beautiful condition, very healthy, and I'd say in the valley, that's your go-to. And that one is wholesale, right? Compost. Your compost is amazing. It's on all. <laughs> I have some pictures of Betty Ford in my uh, presentation too. So, <laughs> so you guys have awesome. more Betty Ford. <laughs> um, um, but the Eagle Gardens, that, I think that's a wholesale one, right? I, I believe I believe it's a wholesale. Um, yeah, I guess the only one up here, I guess, is Wildflower Farms for us, which is kind of kind of okay, depending. I hear they go out of stock really quick, but um. But if you work with a landscaper, they could get the whole the stuff from the wholesale. Yes, they could get the stuff from the wholesale, and then I think Gullies is probably the biggest option that that sells to to anybody. Cool. Thank you. Yes, I I could add a couple. Um, the Garden Center in Gypsum and GH Daniels can both help you out with trees and shrubs. Um, there's a pretty good uh, nursery in. Newcastle as well, um, if you make the trip down there. But a shameless plug, if you live in the town of Vail, you can swing by my office next week between 9 and 4 p.m. and collect one free five-gallon native tree or shrub. We've got some service berry, um, some alders. What else do we have? We have a couple different kinds of current. Um, so if you live in Vail or know someone who does, you're welcome to take advantage of that too. Well, that's fun. Thanks, Pete, for sharing that. <laughs> um, if anybody else doesn't want to share some other good places to get these plants, I think we will take a, just a five minute break to just not be talking for two whole hours. So let's, uh, Come back at 4.22 and we'll pick up with Sean. Don't leave completely because we're going to talk about compost and soil health and it's really exciting. <laughs> Woo! You don't want to miss that. I think it's exciting, Sean.
All right, we're coming back. Um, and we're going to hear from Sean. So I'll really quick introduce Sean and then um, Sean, really the rest of the workshop is all yours. Um, other than questions, which uh, we just, Katie um, from the Vail Chamber and Business Association had to jump off. So I'm not sure we'll have too many questions, but rest is for you, Sean. So Sean is a twice published author a certified compost operations manager and co-chair of the Colorado Compost Council. He teaches compost recycling and soil biology lessons for all ages and sits on boards for organizations with missions that support um, soil and water conservation and sustainable food systems. Sean believes that composting is the ultimate closed loop nutrient man nutrient management system for communities supported by local food, um, improve public health and combat climate change. So I'll stop sharing and then it's all yours. Thank you. All right. So thanks for sticking around everybody. And um, here, let me get you the slideshow. So um, I'm Sean Bruckman from Vale Honey Wagon. We run your local commercial compost facility here in Wolcott, Colorado. And I'll put my information again up at the end. So if you wanna copy that down, you're welcome to contact me to talk more about compost. But I'm just gonna give you a quick overview today and then if you want more information, we can work with Kate and um, go into deeper dives if needed in the future. So first of all, we always ask, uh, why do we compost? Why, do, why, do we, why does it even matter? Why should we be doing that? And so the two main points, I mean, I think there's many, many, many reasons to compost, but the two main points that we'll talk about today and the points that really impact us on a community level and on a climate level are number one, to divert waste from the landfill, and number two, to produce a final product, a soil amendment that can help improve our soil systems for many of the reasons that you've already heard about in the presentation today. So um, composting is really important for the climate. And we started this whole talk and Many of you are here today because of the actively green commitments that you're making for the climate. And we really wanna keep organic waste out of the landfill because in the landfill, as Nina mentioned, it produces methane gas. And a lot of people will ask me, well, you know, why does it matter if I compost because all of my food scraps and my yard waste, it's just gonna break down in the landfill anyway. That's actually not true. So when you bury organic waste in the landfill, the landfill is creates an environment where they are trying to reduce moisture and air so that things don't break down. They don't want things break, to break down and mix together because there's a lot of garbage and chemicals and waste and things that really um, would not be good if it was breaking down. So we, we try to keep that stuff out of the landfill because when it does break down eventually over time it in an, in an anaerobic environment which means an environment without air it produces methane gas and methane gas is much more potent than carbon dioxide you may have heard the terms of like 26 times more potent or maybe 84 times more potent and it's just um the reason you hear those different numbers is because methane actually lasts in the atmosphere in a shorter time frame than carbon dioxide. So in the short span, it is 84 times more potent, but in the long span of how long a carbon dioxide molecule stays in the atmosphere, it's more like 24. So it's just, if you hear the variation in that, it's, it's uh, talking about the lifespan of that molecule in the atmosphere. So that's a little bit of a science background for you. And when you put compost on the soil and have healthy soil, it actually does the opposite and pulls carbon out of the atmosphere. So that's, we can reverse climate change, not only help climate, but reverse it through composting. And that's why composting is so wonderful. 
And so just to give you a little bit about the compost process, this is a picture of our facility out here in Walcott. This is our front end loader that we use to turn the piles. And composting is a biological control mechanism that protects human health and the environment. And what I mean by that is that we're using microbes and an oxygen rich environment to create a system and a product that is more healthy for people, for the air quality, for water quality, and for potential ha hazards in our environment with leaching and any kind of um, things that could get into our water systems. So composting is really, really important tool that we have to manage our waste. And we're really lucky that we have this opportunity and this tool to manage it here, right here in Eagle County. So we don't have to send it to any other county or any other state or waste any transportation to take our organic waste and turn it into a new resource right here in Eagle County. It's pretty incredible. And we're really lucky to have all of you and our community members and our businesses that support local composting. It is so important and so, I'm so grateful for our community that really allows all of this to happen. And then another benefit of composting is that it's more cost effective way to dispose of your yard waste. So if you were to take a load of yard waste to the landfill, it would actually cost more in disposal than it does at our compost facility. And we did that on purpose. We really want to incentivize landscapers and property managers and landowners to be able to take their, comp their organic waste and bring it to our compost facility and save money and still be able to, we've still had to price it in a way that can support a business model. So it is self-sustaining. We're not depending on taxes or anything from any uh, handouts from the government to support the system. It's, it's a sustainable business model that uses the tipping fees and the fees of service to be able to produce and keep this running, yet it's also more cost effective than going to the landfill. And I think a lot of people just don't understand that this option is here. So that's what we're working with the Climate Action Collaborative and other partners like the people on this call to try to really get the word out there and let people know that this option is available to dispose of your organic waste, yard waste and food waste here at the Honey Wagon Compost Facility in Walcott. So now to give you a little more information on how and when to do that, if you would like to bring yard waste out to our facility, you can bring it any time during operating hours. So operating hours are Monday through Thursday. It's actually 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And you can come anytime between 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And sorry about that and um, dispose of material at our facility at 955 Ute Creek Road in Walcott, Colorado. And um, if you would like us to collect the compost for you, we can do that too. So you can bring it to us or we can come and pick it up. And so I am showing you here on this slide, three different options of how we can contain your organic waste and bring it to our facility. So on the far right, we have the smallest option, well, the smallest option would be a five gallon bucket, but for businesses, the smallest option is these 32 gallon carts and you can have as many of those carts as you need. Um, we usually do a minimum of two and we have some clients that have up to eight, but once you get to six carts, it's kind of a better option to go this option in the middle of these small dumpsters. These are metal dumpsters with metal lids and that means that they are bear proof. And I'm not sure if you all knew this, but bears can eat through plastic. Bears are pretty strong. And even though we have bear resistant plastic containers at all of our homes and in our neighborhoods with special locks on them, nothing is completely bear proof other than metal on metal with a metal locking bar. That is the only thing that is really bear proof is metal. So um, some of you have probably experienced that before. Those bears can be pretty uh, resilient when they, they know what they want. So, um, so we do have that option for areas where you need that extra bear proofing or where you just need something a little bit more condensed and efficient. Those small dumpsters work really well. And then on the far left, we have roll-off dumpsters. 
And so we could do roll off dumpsters. We have quite a few landscape companies that have these roll off dumpsters at their yard and they fill it up and um, make sure that they have a, a clean, clean material that's coming to us. We also have some large scale businesses that are using these roll offs. So an example would be Vail Resorts is using these roll offs um, to contain food waste and send it to us during the busy season and then golf courses. So, um, so Beaver Creek uh, golf course also has one of these and sends us large loads of, of waste. Um, there's many, many businesses and landscapers who are using those, utilizing those roll offs and it's a really convenient way for them, efficient for their operations and easy for us to pick up and get out of their way. Now, the really important thing is what not to put in the compost. And this is almost more than important than what to put in the compost. And so um, you can see in the middle, there's some landscaping waste outside of the compost dumpster. First of all, please don't ever put something outside of a locked dumpster. It will go in the trash and we're not going to pick it up as compost if you didn't call us and set that up with us. So um, so that's unfortunate that all of this had to go to the trash. Um, but the big problem here is that it's in plastic bags and we cannot compost plastic bags. So that is a, a big problem. And for efficiency of our processes, we don't empty plastic bags. If you would like us to empty plastic bags, we could charge extra fees to do that extra labor, but that is not part of our processes. So it's really important to that we have landscapers and anybody collecting lawn waste to either use a paper bag or a compostable bag, or just simply put it in the dumpster. So that's, that's one thing we do not take is plastic bags and there are heavy fines for disposing of plastic bags and solid waste and trash in our compost dumpsters. On the far right, you see some branches. Uh, it's not that we don't accept branches. We do accept small branches, but they are they do cost a larger fee because the grinding cost for us is so high. So um, that would be something I would just recommend to call me about if you want to compost branches and we can look at solutions individually for your business or property. And then you see some horses on the left and you might think, well, I know manure is an organic waste. Why wouldn't I be able to compost manure or maybe compost the horse itself when it's done with its life, which we can do. But um, with the manure, we are, uh, I'm really, really hesitant on the manures that I take. So I do a, a heavy screening process before accepting manures into our collection program. So again, if you have manures, contact me and we'll, uh, We'll go over that screening process and make sure that we can help you divert as much as organic waste as possible. So the reason that we have that screening, pro and I did mention the horses themselves, so I should probably touch on that. Um, so composting, actually you can, you can compost uh, animal remains, and maybe some of you have seen the human remains composting bill that recently came out. Uh, it is possible. We are all made of organic material. We're made of carbon, so we are organic organisms. And, um, and we do not compost human remains or animal remains at our compost at this time. Even though it's possible, uh, we're not there yet. Just wanted to uh, let you all know that in case <laughs> there were some questions that were coming up on that. So this is the main reason for um, for screening manures is this persistent herbicides. And these terrify me, terrify like, oh my gosh, everything that I am so passionate about with composting would be completely destroyed if we got these, these uh, substances in our compost. And Pete did a really great job of telling you about the history of some of the chemicals that we use in our landscaping. And so um, these are some chemicals that absolutely cannot come to our compost facility. So uh, you can see, sorry, there's a lot of words on here, but this was a really important one that I wanted everybody to see. So the, the main chemical components are clopyrrolid, piclorum, amino pyrrolids and amino cyclopyrrochlor, something like that. And so the, the terms that you're gonna be seeing more commonly if you do any landscaping or if you have a landscaping crew or if you hire landscapers come out to your facility, these 
chemicals are commonly and widely used in our community. So a lot of them are used on pasture lands and that's where the manure comes in and a lot of uh, animal feed is, this is used to ensure that there's weed free hay. Well, that's great that it's weed free, but it probably has all these chemicals that I can't take, which now makes it not compostable. Um, so these are some of the names you might see. You might see Tardon, um, Pathway is used a lot, Millennium, Milestone. Milestone is used a lot around here, Forefront. Um, so just be aware that those chemicals are out there. If you do plan on composting anything from your properties, please make sure you do not use these to control your weeds. Uh, we can talk about more, more options for you. And I've also took the liberty to give you some more resources right here. The United States Compost Council is really trying to address this. And the Colorado Compost Council, which we're a member of, is also really trying to implement policy and require more labeling so that more people understand the risks of using these products. But in the meantime, this number one, uh, understanding persistent herbicides can be found on the Composting Council website. It's a really great resource and I send it to all the landscapers and property managers that we work with just so that everybody is aware and especially agricultural clients just to make sure everybody is aware of um, the dangers and what we're looking for and why. And so the big thing is if we end up with these things in our compost, it doesn't break down, we sell it to you, you put it on your plants and it kills everything that's not a grass. And so you spend all this money on these beautiful perennial flowers that Colin told you all about. And then you put my compost on and it would kill everything. So we do not want that to happen. <laughs> and that is a huge danger and it would, it would shut down our facility, it would shut down our opportunity for everybody to be able to compost in our community. Um, so please help spread the word. This is really, really important. And if you take nothing else away from my presentation, this would be the one. Thank you, thank you, thank you for attention on that. And so I just wanna take my last few minutes to uh, share with you some of the benefits of using compost. And this will kind of wrap back around to what um, James and Peter and Colin were all talking about in um, water efficiency and utilizing our water in a smart way. When we put compost on the soil, we have healthier soil and healthier soil is able to get nutrients. If you remember from Colin's presentation, the roots in the soil and how the roots can go out and grab nutrients and bring them in. Um, he also talked a lot about how the healthy plants will create protection so that you don't have as many weeds. Well, having healthy soil will also create protection for your plants because it'll help um, balance out the, the pests and the bugs in the soil so that you don't have an overabundance of a pest that you might not want on your plants. Um, it's also helpful for aerating the soil, improving water holding capacity and improving the life in the soil, which is gonna balance out everything. Um, and then it just really makes your soil more spongy so that it can hold on to water. Some areas have found that you can have up to 30% water reduction by having healthy soil. Um, so that is really exciting. And so how do we foster healthy soil? How do we, how do you create an environment that fosters healthy soil? And what is healthy soil? So just to start out, soil is about a quarter air, a quarter water, and about half minerals, not quite half minerals, 40 to 45% minerals. And good healthy soil has five to 10% organic matter. And you can find out how much organic matter you have in your soil by getting a basic test from CSU, check out your CSU extension and they can get you um, any basic tests. You can find out how much organic matter you have. If you don't have enough organic matter or your pH is off or your balance of soil structure is off, your best solution for all of those things is compost. And so uh, compost is really, I mean, I there's no silver bullet for anything, but compost is really close. So uh, compost is really, really, nutrient rich, it's biologically diverse, and it helps increase the, the natural fertility and moisture holding capacity of the soil like we've been talking about. So it's, it's really important to get compost in your soil, especially out here where we have this clay heavy rocky soil. Um, utilizing the right plants can also 
build organic matter like Colin was talking about over time, you can definitely build healthy soil through plants as well. And that's really incredible. But in the beginning, you should use compost to supplement your soil. And then also it's a great top dressing. I know actually in Cordillera, there's the landscape company up there uses a lot of compost as a top dressing. It creates a really nice finish and also helps to improve the soil while creating this beautiful finish on the garden beds. So uh, multi-uses for that compost. And um, so as we talked about, the benefits of using compost in the soil are vast, but I just wanna make a couple of quick points on this one because compost really, really improves the biology of the soil. And that's what I feel is the most important because the biology is gonna help improve the chemical and the physical properties of the soil as well. So if you see um, the picture of the little wormy guy on the bottom, that is a picture of a parasitic nematode. And that nematode wants to go in and kill, penetrate the cell wall of the plant and eat that plant from the inside out. And that, that's very common pest in the, in the garden or in your landscape. The thing around its neck that looks like a necklace, that's actually a fungus that has a beneficial relationship with the plants in the soil. So that fungus is protecting the plants because the plant is feeding the fungus. And so if you have healthy soil, you will have these fungus in there protecting your plant naturally for you. If you're using chemicals and fertilizers, that fungus won't be there. It won't have any reason or purpose to be there because it doesn't need to have that relationship with the plant because you're synthetically feeding that plant a portion of what it needs to live, not even everything. And so by having the bugs in the soil, you're really, really promoting the plant to naturally have a healthy immune system and not be so dependent on all of these chemicals that we, we think the plants might need. Mother Earth has really figured it out and, um, and we don't really need to get in the way. We just need to sit back and observe. And then this other cool one is these um, little nodules on this plant root. When you look at the root and those little balls, that's nitrogen fixing bacteria. And that literally pulls nitrogen out of the atmosphere. So in Pete's presentation, when he talked about the clover in the soil, that is um, an example of a plant that has relationship with these nitrogen fixing uh, nodules here. And it helps bring nitrogen into the soil. So sometimes you don't really need to use fertilizer. You can just plant other plants that are gonna produce the same results. And your local compost is so important for that because it's gonna have local bugs. And um, that's really important for our community and our soil. And it also puts the resources back into the soil right here locally so that we can, um, you know, we can have this resource regenerating in our own, right, in our own region. And these are some ways to apply compost. Um, I can't see the chat, so uh, this is my last slide, Kate. If I'm going over, just interrupt me. But I just wanted to mention for this group that um, the compost applications are varied, but uh, if we do have business owners, land managers that are gonna be watching this, uh, these are some really great ways that we can see that compost is important in commercial horticulture. These, uh, this erosion control here is actually filled with compost. So not only is it in a, in a construction project, not only is it capturing any sediment to help protect our waterways, but it's also filled with compost. So it's help filtering that even further through the microorganisms that are that are capturing all of that nutrient overload as well and protecting our waterways more. Um, this project over here on the left is a is another way that compost is being used on a slope to prevent erosion. And there was a huge project up on Independence Pass where they sprayed compost and had really great results on revegetating the natural spaces out there. And um, and it and it's also used in roadways and along some of the revegetation for projects in communities, community parks, and roadways. And actually, CDOT has a rule that every road project in the state of Colorado is required to use compost when available in that area. So um, we've made some great strides as an industry and in utilizing compost and I hope that businesses in Eagle County can help to continue that and promote and, and keep using compost on our local landscape so that we can complete the loop and, and close, the, close the loop in our uh, resource recycling here. 
And here's my information again. And here's that picture of Betty Ford Gardens. This is in the spring before everything is popping, but you could see that they had uh, utilized our compost and put it on all of their perennial beds here. And it's a, it creates a nice mulch, a nice cover, so it doesn't look sloppy or messy. And then when all of that grows in, it'll cover up. You won't see the compost anymore, and it helps provide all of those benefits that we were talking about for soil health. Awesome. Thanks, John. I have a question and then Tim also has a question. Um, where was that picture uh, where they were using compost to help filter uh, any erosion before it went into the water? Do you know where that was? Oh, where that was? Yeah. You know, I'm not sure where that picture was. I just kind of took that one. Uh, I found it. But I do know that they use that a lot in California because they have very strict regulations. Yeah. And there's um, they're using it in Fort Collins and on their front range, too, uh, because there's a company that um, that makes those socks that compost producers can fill and then um, sell to contractors. So oh. that company is based out of California. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That's cool. I have I didn't know that. I haven't seen that before. But um, then Tim had a question too. Hi, Sean. Hi. How are you? Um, I'm not sure if you can see Tim. He's over here. Yeah. Good. Sorry, you're all on like one little screen here. <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about uh, bears. I have an interesting theory about bears and compost. Correct me when I'm wrong. So we had a bear just walk by our compost bin and go for the bird seed and didn't even bother with our compost bin. Is there anything to be said about bears and like wildlife understanding that this food's like breaking down and it's really not something they want? Is that true? Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's something that I learned, gosh, back when I took master mountain composter certification course a couple of years ago. And that was one of the biggest things that I, I thought was really interesting. And now I share that a lot with, uh, you know, some of our community composting that we do in the community gardens is that bears really don't want uh, dirt. They don't want, they might want rotting food. Yeah, they, they might be okay with some rotting food, but I think they'd rather have fresh food. And I think if you're incorporating like, paper and compostable cups and compostable plates and stuff like that and there's an easier source of like you said bird seed was there well yeah seeds and berries are going to be much more of their natural diet than something that's mixed with paper and like rotting and so i think you're exactly right tim and i always tell backyard composters that that if they're doing it correctly and if they're mixing the appropriate recipes that bear, animals should not be getting into the compost. If animals are getting in, you're doing something wrong. But <laughs> I mean, obviously if you have a bin for compost, that it's mostly rotting food. So we still have to be careful. But I think, I think you're spot on with that is that that's not their first choice. Cool, thanks Sean, appreciate you. Yeah, this is all really interesting. And I'm, um, I'm sure businesses will appreciate learning all about this. It's fun to all, it's always fun to hear you talk about the compost facility because you're clearly so passionate about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for having me here. I was really actually, uh, um, I, I'm humbled by all of the other presentations that were here today. This was so great. And I can't wait to share the video with, with everybody and, and spread this around. And thanks for everybody who came to uh, participate. Yeah. We'll have to um, add it to a library for the Actively Green program. Um, and hopefully this will be helpful for the next you know, year or maybe two years even. Um, but after, after the workshop, I will share all the resources that everybody mentioned throughout the workshop so that um, people don't have to listen through the whole thing to get a list of those resources and, I'll, and then I'll share the obviously the recording and the slides um, so you, everybody will have contact information. Um, and then we were just going to end with questions and um, some questions, I guess the questions in the beginning that 
um, a lot of businesses to just think about. Uh, but I'm not sure we will have any more questions. Anybody else here have any questions? Kate, do you guys have like a water resource? Like, we're looking, we're now in tier five, so we're trying to reduce our water use and we're trying to figure out a consultant or someone that can help us do that with a lot of our landscaping in the next year or so. Oh, yeah. Is that um, uh, yes. Pete mentioned a resource, mm -hmm. a list of um, people that could help with that. And I think there were a couple other resources too that he had mentioned that stood out to me. Um, but just thinking about some of the landscaping companies mm -hmm. in the valley that you could work with that know a lot about how to reduce water use and uh, use water more efficiently. Mm -hmm. I can think of, um, yeah, connecting you with them or or um, the Actively Green program also works with that the data management company, THG Energy Solutions. So just tracking your water and um, having the meters separate for outside and inside would they would be able to help consult you, but I would recommend just starting with the local resources available, um, which I'm sure Pete will have um, a recommendation too. Awesome. Tim, I'd, I'd recommend reaching out to, um, I think the name's Brian Bear Brian. Um, at, at ET Irrigation. ET is it? Brian. Is it, his first name is Brian. I might have his last name wrong. Um, Brian at ET Irrigation. They're actually Denver based, but they do a lot of work up here. <clears throat> um, and they're pretty proactive about reducing, um, you know, water waste, really optimizing irrigation. Uh, they'll probably start you off by just trying to optimize your ir irrigation for the landscaping that you have. Um, and maybe next year consider retrofitting to more Zurich landscaping. Um, Chris Wolf at Eagle River Water and Sanitation District can also help you track your water use trends. Um, you might wanna reach out to him. He's got good resources for, for following along what you're using currently. Yeah, okay. So we've been talking to Chris a little bit. And, um... I would also add to that, um, Mountain Organics is really, really, uh, passionate about water conservation. And then I would kind of kick it over to James because he runs the water working group. And there's quite a few landscapers at the water working group who are talking about this. And they, uh, James, you could probably talk a little bit more about the certification that some of those landscapers have that um, is re really high standards. Yeah, so we're working on bringing the, the Quell training to our community, which is the Qualified Water Efficient Landscaping Program. And it's through, I believe, the EPA, part of their Water Sense program. Um, but we're working on bringing that to the Eagle Valley with Eagle River Water and Sanitation District. So there are a few landscapers in the group right now that are certified. And then we hope to just really go hit all of the landscapers, all of the irrigators in our community over the next couple of years. Um, that program is launching, I believe, next April. Um, so it's the, it's the Quell program and they have their own database on the Quell website, which may be helpful, but also might be too broad. Um, I think starting with the Town of Vales landscapers list is probably a, a good place. Cool, thank you guys for all that insight. Yeah. Mountain Organic will be a good resource because uh, like Sean said, they are so passionate about water. They have a lot of knowledge and water efficiency and yeah, they really are very passionate about water. Are they, are they the Roarigs? Yes, okay. yes. Uh -huh. cool. So yeah, yeah, they're part of the water working group too. Cool. Yeah, that's the Quell. Thanks for reminding me, James. The Quell certification, they they are really big into that. And they're, I think they are certified to be instructors of that. So they're, they have really high standards. Cool. And they're working with uh, Dave over at the Wildflower Farm now too, to expand their resources. I think they already do stuff at the hospital. So you're already in with them. Is Pristine yeah. your landscaper? Pristine, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yep. Just talk to Pristine and they're already partnering with Mountain Organics. So I wouldn't even switch your landscaper. I would just tell them that that's what you want to incorporate and they're already partners with the resources you need. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>
And then metering too, I think would, would be helpful, which maybe you're already doing that. Um, but Chris Wolf would be able to help with that too, along with everyone else. Yeah. Urban. Not to drive the ending too, yeah. Um, then I just wanted to share some of the upcoming events um, this summer for the Actively Green program, um, which if you're listening, you may have realized that if you join these workshops and trainings, um, there's usually a lot of guest speakers and we can usually make the connections that businesses need to get done what, uh, to meet their goals and get done what they would like to have done pretty quickly. Um, so there's some purchasing workshops. There's a series. So the first one is goods and services and then um, beneficial electrification will be like the main focus of the second one. Uh, the intro training, then some energy efficiency workshops, and the co-working opportunities in September is still in the works that might have some little mini workshops and trainings. Um, and then just want to say thank you to all of our presenters for making this workshop so full of resources and knowledge and exciting and passionate speakers so thank you thanks, thanks for you. bringing us together kate this was a, a fantastic group of folks and i echo uh sean's thank you and this was very interesting